impressive. Anyway, this lecture is on somatopause, uh, adult growth hormone deficiency syndrome. Adult growth hormone deficiency syndrome is the term that you should be using on your medical records to avoid any pro problems with the government. This is basically what we'll go over. Instead of looking at what we're going over, let's go into it. Well, looking at growth hormone stimulation, there are a number of things that will cause it to increase. Um, growth hormone releasing hormone. So if we can increase growth hormone releasing hormone, we can naturally increase growth hormone level. Ghrelin, sleep, melatonin will positively increase the production of growth hormone. So if you're living in an environment where you have changing lights, uh, you know, your alarm clock has a bright light on it, you go to the bathroom and it shuts off your melatonin. So supplementing with a small dose of melatonin will help to keep the tonus and production of, of uh, growth hormone up. Intense aerobic activity, Hypoglycemia, no one's fun on hypoglycemia. Dietary protein, good protein intake. Not vegan, not, not uh, I apologize, any vegans? Apologize. But you need your protein, some form, to get these specific amino acids into the system, which have a unique ability to specifically, through receptors we're now finding, increase the natural production of growth hormone. Arginine, arginine works in a reverse manner, suppress the suppressor, and you have free flowing or increase of production from the anterior pituitary of growth hormone. Estradiol, well, centrally, it actually increases growth hormone by helping the production in the anterior uh, pituitary and peripherally can reduce the receptor reception of the, it's a party, reception of the growth hormone. Inhibitors of growth hormone, obviously circulating uh, GH and IGF-1, which is the feedback loop, Dietary carbohydrates, that's why they said, you know, for many years when we were giving uh, injections of growth hormone, you know, don't have a high carbohydrate load. It can interfere with it. Glucocorticoids, high levels of uh, cortisol can depress the production of growth hormone by the anterior pituitary. Low levels of DHEA, high levels that actually increases, magnifies the growth hormone releasing factors effect on the anterior pituitary. Obesity, fat, tamoxifen, tamoxifen. How many people use tamoxifen in their practice? Good. Other causes of growth hormone deficiency, the outside world, traumatic brain injury, hypothalamic damage is what leads to the problem. The anterior pituitary works, but the regulatory system telling it to produce the growth hormone, testosterone, gonadotropic hormones, and so forth. Also, Sheehan's, and every woman who has a uh, baby is at risk of having Sheehan's. Sheehan's is uh, panhypopituitaryism, but what we're probably seeing is that it's not the full spectrum, it's just a little bit of it. So instead of having every hormone being deficient, they've got selective hormone deficiency. So Sheehan's, people, women who have had multiple pregnancies and you ask whether or not they've had difficult vaginal deliveries or prolonged delivery. Environmental toxins, food, air, water. Chemotherapy, patients who have had cancer therapy for whatever end up having depressed levels of hormone production because of direct cytotoxic effect of the chemicals we use. Common x-ray exposure, CT scans, dental x-ray, plain skull x-rays. What they found is that these x-rays will damage the hypothalamus. Direct effect of tamoxifen on growth hormone secretion by the pituitary. Here's the article, 1992. As little as 10 micromoles is enough to decrease the basal production of growth hormone. Radiation, x-ray, this is from 2006. It's a bad slide. But these are the pathways, growth hormone and how it helps, IGF-1 and how it helps. You've got cellular repair, cellular protection, and healing. And that's really the key in adult growth hormone deficiency syndrome, why we want to return growth hormone to a physiological level, is because all the benefits. I broke my toe last week in a silly five o'clock in the morning walking down the steps and started injecting myself with growth hormone. Now I can say that because I have adult growth hormone deficiency syndrome. If I had used it off label for an orthopedic injury, they'd lock me up and throw the key away. It's illegal to do that. So within three days, the black and blue is gone, the ecchymosis is gone, the swelling is gone, and I'm walking on it. Almost run, ran because my plane was late, almost ran on it. A little uncomfortable, but it heals. We have orthopedic cases with multiple comminuted fractures, guys in sports, guys in motocross, who are healing a lot faster ahead of UCLA spine 
was looking at some of our cases, uh, spinal surgery repairing in half the time without the residual side effects. Growth hormone deficiency versus insufficiency. This is our quagmire. How do we define it? I'm really not going to tell you here because it was earlier. But nothing in medicine is absolute except death, and that is now questionable. You can go ask Elvis. Laboratory testing is part of the means by which we make and confirm our clinical diagnoses, which include the patient's symptomatic complaints. So what you need to do is make sure when you first see that patient, you get an unbelievable amount of patient input. Because that patient input against our objectivity in our laboratory testing, I mean, we know of, I mean, in psychiatry, what's the objectivity to allow us to give 14 different antipsychotic drugs? There isn't any. It's all subjective. So bring in the subjective from the patient, and kissing the forehead doesn't help. Growth hormone uh, deficiency, insufficiency, these are degrees of laboratory testing. And there are so many things that influence it. And as you know, there's this spike up and down of growth hormone. They can have low sugar, be hyperglycemic, get up a level that's artificially elevated, take an overwhelming amount of amino acids and artificially have it elevated. So, you know, the testing is not that accurate, but it's the best that we have. So working within the governmental system, working within our system, you have to establish your cut line for deficiency, your cut line for insufficiency. insufficiency. Numbers are just a guide. I've never been a great believer in the numbers because when before uh, Wilson's or um, no sub, uh, subclinical hypothyroidism, patient would come in with all the symptoms of hypothyroidism, and you did the testing, and they were you know low normal, they were fine, and you wouldn't treat them until they came in with myxedema. I think what we're seeing in a lot of cases is this progression where eventually they'll get there. Do we want to wait until they're dead before we consider treating them? Obviously not. The diagnosis of partial growth hormone deficiency in adults, uh, if they have a hypothalamic damage, the HPA is damaged, traumatic brain injury, a lot of x-ray, then it will give us a lot more insight and impetus to go ahead and chase uh, the deficiency state or insufficiency state by doing the urine 24-hour growth hormone level, doing the ALS, uh, which is the uh, acid lay bile subunit, doing the binding protein 3, make sure you get a lot of information so that when you present it, you're protected. 